Calling, 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 calling. Call the growth buster. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Welcome to the Growth Busters Podcast, a service of the Growth Busters Project, where we are working practically around the clock to find the cure for growth addiction. On today's episode, science proves kids are bad for Earth. Oh, baby, the fertility rate is way down, and yes, that's a huge problem. And world scientists warning to humanity a second notice. We have got some very exciting things to talk about today. I'm Dave Gardner, Growthbuster-in-Chief here at the Growthbusters Project. We're in hot pursuit of charting a sustainable course for human civilization, and that means getting our population and economy sized appropriately so that future generations can live decent lives on a planet with healthy life support systems. For cutting-edge information about our culture's unsustainable love affair with growth and what we can do about it, visit growthbusters.org. I'm joined today by... Caitlin Hickman and Ben Bacher, two seniors from Colorado College who are part of the growth busting team. How's campus life treating you guys? Not bad. <laughs> pretty good, pretty busy, but solid. Yeah. Well, are you energized and ready to talk about some of the most important issues in the world? You yeah. say so. All right, well, let's get after it. Number one, posted November 15th at NBC News Digital in the Think section under Thought Experiment. And thought experiment is the big questions and big solutions currently being pondered by the world's thought leaders. We have science proves kids are bad for earth. Morality suggests we stop having them. Whoa. (laughs) That headline is a showstopper. Yeah, it is. Well, what does this say and who wrote it? And uh, it turns out that the essay is written by someone that we really respect and admire here at Growthbusters, Travis Mm -hmm. Reader, right? When you saw that headline, though, did you stop and think? Did it make you wonder whether that was really Travis's work? Yeah, it did. (laughs) Because it's so, yeah, it's so out there. I feel like he's usually very careful about his word choice and careful not to, like, make anyone feel excluded from the conversation or turn anyone away. He sort of manipulates people into listening to his very thoughtful (laughs) words. And that was just so direct. But... True. Well, I suppose, man. (laughs) Over the top true. And you're right, Travis. I think one of the reasons we have so much respect for Travis is he's, well, he's very articulate, but he's also very sensitive. I mean, he's objective, Mm -hmm. he's scientific, he's logical. He doesn't tend to be uh, one to embrace hyperbole and to to go to extremes. He's Mm -hmm. very careful and considered in what he has to say. Mm -hmm. So that headline just shocked me. Yeah, right. It's very editorialized. So I want to talk about that headline in a minute. But first, let me fill you in. If you're not familiar with Travis Reeder out there in uh, podcast listener land, he is a bioethicist who teaches philosophy at Johns Hopkins University. He's written two things that greatly interest us here at Growth Busters, and I cannot recommend them highly enough. One is a short book called Toward a Small Family Ethic, How Overpopulation and Climate Change Are Changing the Morality of Procreation. And the other is a paper that he wrote with a couple other gentlemen called Population Engineering and the Fight Against Climate Change. Travis has been interviewed on NPR. He's been a guest on the HBO series Bill Nye Saves the World. His work's been featured in New Scientist, Forbes, Foreign Policy Magazine, Bloomberg, Washington Post, and the UK Guardian. This guy's getting around, and and we have really celebrated him because he's been bringing the conversation about the morality of family size decisions to the fore and breaking down the taboo that we've long held about talking about overpopulation at all, let alone talking about the people's family size decisions. So mm-hmm. so that's the guy, Travis Reeder. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll include in the show notes links so you can easily find his book and the paper and a couple of other deep and insightful podcast interviews that he's done. But back to that headline. Kids are bad for Earth. That's provocative, and it's attention-getting, but it's also very negative. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I kind of wonder if NBC was involved at all in the creation of the title, just because Mm, it's super... If I see that title, I'm like, what? Like, I feel like it's kind of clickbaity, whereas if it's something more, a little more reserved and maybe something more along the lines of what Travis was thinking, then it might not be as much of a page-viewed article. 
very astute theorizing on your part. <laughs> same yeah. same thought. Yeah, Caitlin. Yeah, and you know, it turns out that even when reporters write news stories, almost never do the reporters write the headlines. Right. So interesting. And I wonder how many times the reporters get yeah. in a fight with the editors oh. over the headlines. Because sure. for me, it just seems like the one word that gets me is just the proofs. Like, as, as, like scientifically speaking, that's a pretty dangerous word to get into, I think. I don't know. Well, I wondered the same things. So I, I called Travis yeah. to find out what was going on there. Let's listen to that conversation. Okay. First of all, I called you because... Travis, I was a little surprised, shocked really, to see that headline above your byline on NBC Digital. I was too. <laughs> um, yeah, so you, you might know that um, titles are almost always editorial decisions, and I know that. I've, I've written for the media quite a lot, but um, I've only actually had one time prior where an editorial team was going to add a fairly controversial title. And it was much more mundane than this one. And it was still controversial enough that they called me to okay it before running with it. Um, so I was really quite unhappy when NBC News uh, launched the article. I didn't even know it was coming out that day. And I woke up to a Twitter feed full of, of hate tweets and uh, attached to this article that says, science proves kids are bad for Earth. Morality suggests we stop having them. And, um, well, that that title is doubly false, right? Science doesn't prove anything. That's a terrible phrase. And my argument has never been that morality suggests we stop having them. My argument has always been that morality suggests perhaps we ought to have fewer. Yeah. So I was very unhappy. And um, I immediately at like 6 a.m. emailed my editor. And uh, she said, well, it's out of my hand. It's the editorial team. And um, she told them my preference and they didn't change it. Do you think maybe you, you were had... That, that they baited you with the intention of sabotaging the conversation and making you look insensitive? Oh, I don't think so. Um, uh, I, I think what I told my editor, uh, who was very nice, and um, we'd had a long relationship while we were working on this, I, I told her that it was a clickbait title, and that I, as, as an academic, as a scholar, I did not appreciate my work, which um, is on a nuanced topic. It's about you know responding to these fairly complicated arguments. Uh, I did not appreciate that work being attached to such a clickbait title, but, um, you know, it, uh, everyone who publishes this stuff, they want people to click on their articles. Uh, I just thought this was a terrible way to go about it. Yeah. Uh, so one of my questions you've halfway answered, which was what kind of, uh, feedback you got that headline definitely had an impact. Oh yeah. No, it's, I, well, you'll appreciate this, Dave, since we've been talking for a while. Um, the, the response I got, you know, the combination of the audience who um, finds this particular website and the title and then the, you know, um, tension of the topic, I got so much nasty emails and tweets. I turned off all notifications on Twitter and I got handwritten hate mail delivered to my office. Um, so I actually said to Sadia, my partner, one night, I said, you know what? I'm not sure that I can have this conversation in the public for the time being anymore. Um, and you know that I've been doing this for a while. And, and it's always tense, but it was particularly bad this time. Oh, that breaks my heart to hear that. Yeah, so I'm, you know, I'm talking to you, so I'm obviously not uh, <laughs> so com so committed to never having this conversation anymore. But um, yeah, it was just there was there was zero um, sensitive engagement with the fairly nuanced arguments in the essay. Every piece of feedback that was directed to me that I got. Um, well, that's probably unfair. I probably got a couple of nice emails. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I know I got a couple of nice emails from people, but almost everything was uh, really hateful and upsetting. So uh, what about uh, from the professional community? Did you get, uh, did you hear from your fellow philosophers and ethicists? No, not really. Um, somebody posted on my Facebook page, hey, I was going to send you this article. And then I realized you wrote it. <laughs> um, 
And the, the comments that were made in that thread were basically, you know, the content of the article was maybe, perhaps, we ought to be careful when thinking about the ethics of procreation. And then the content of the headline was, oh, my God, babies are evil and they're going to kill us all. So, it's, so do you think this has set the conversation back? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if, if people pay attention enough um, to, to one piece or to what I write that it could really set the conversation back. But um, it was not good, I don't think. Uh, it was not helpful. Definitely an opportunity lost at the very least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I had been invited to write this piece. I hadn't submitted it. I had been invited to write it. And I said, oh, you know, I do have something new I'm working on. There's this these interesting arguments. So um, uh, Roberts over at Box, you know, had been saying some interesting things. And the arguments are nuanced. They're not um, they're not bad arguments. So they deserve a response. And I thought, oh, you know, I should write a response article. So it was uh, it was supposed to be uh, a fairly uh, intellectual exercise, and it just didn't get that uptake at all. Well, I'm really sorry. Uh, you know, I thought the piece was well written, and I just I just knew that couldn't have been your headline. <laughs> So I was devastated. Well, I'm glad, I'm glad you could tell that. I'm glad that you would not assume that that was mine, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I know uh, you're trying to uh, keep some balance in your life, so I don't want to keep you. Any last words before we hang up? Um, I, I don't know if it matters to you, but, I mean, the thing that I found um, kind of most offensive in the response to the article from people who clearly actually read it is, um, you know, I make a, a fairly abstract philosophical point, which is that more than one person can be fully morally responsible for an outcome. And that's an interesting philosophical point that requires argumentation. And so to make it clear that that's the case, I use a completely disconnected example, which is if I um, release a, a, a murderer from prison, if I break them out, uh, knowing that they're going to go on and kill people, then I bear responsibility for the outcome of them killing people, even though they're obviously fully responsible for killing people. So the math, the moral mathematics doesn't add up to 100%. That's a fairly like abstract sort of point. And the way that got taken up cannot have been in good faith because in the people who wrote nasty stuff about the essay, they all said, Travis Reader compares having kids to releasing a murderer from prison. And I was... I was so furious at that intentional misreading. It must have been an intentional misreading. Oh, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, you know, you and I have had fairly optimistic conversations about um, the direction that this broader public conversation is going. And I'm not feeling so optimistic these days. Well... I don't know what to say. I'm going to check back. Yeah. I, if it's all right with you, I'm going to circle back after the first of the year, and I'm going to hope that the uh, that the memory is not lingering and that uh, there's more reasons for optimism and hope. Sounds good. Sounds yeah. good. So thanks, uh, thanks for putting yourself out there, and welcome to my club. <laughs> <laughs> you got it, Dave. All right. All right. Well, thanks for the call. Anyway. Take all care. Right. Bye-bye. Wow. Yeah. Yikes. So I really hated to hear that. Yeah, that yeah. sucks. I'm not feeling so optimistic these days. Well, how optimistic are you guys feeling? <laughs> it's hard. It's a challenging time to feel optimistic. You know, we've been celebrating progress, and a lot of that's been based on some of the things that Travis has done. It certainly hasn't been just Travis, but we had that great Lund University study that got pretty good headlines about the relationship between having a child and carbon footprint avoiding the worst of climate change, things like that. And so we've been kind of celebrating the fact that the taboo on overpopulation has been uh, eroding a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so that was why I asked that question. Do you think this uh, set the conversation back? Mm -hmm. And boy, and I really hate to hear someone who's been such an articulate champion to be pessimistic. Yeah, right, right, right. It seemed like it really hurt him <laughs> on a personal level. I don't know the response. Which yeah. makes sense. Yeah. yeah if he, I mean, if he puts so much work into carefully articulating his argument and then people spun it and just yes. trashed on him personally that yeah that's really frustrating i've had to develop a pretty thick skin telling people what they don't want to hear that we are in overshoot and that we can't grow our economy forever and that we really need to think very seriously about how many children we conceive and 
you know, I'm sure Travis <laughs> has been developing thick skin on steroids, yeah. but even yeah. with that thick skin, it's still right. It's getting still personal, hard. like handwritten hate mail, like that's pretty intense. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, um, briefly, let's talk a little bit about the real meat, the good stuff in yeah. that, you know, because we shouldn't let the headline ruin it. But I really want to kind of get your reaction and see if there's some highlights that you want to underscore or anything like that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the thing that stood out to me is the thing that Travis talked mm-hmm. about in the interview, which is that there's no like mathematical calculation for moral responsibility. And another metaphor that I can think of is if you tell your friend to punch someone in the face and then they punch someone in the face, you're not the person who did the punchings. They obviously are morally responsible, but you still have some responsibility. Right. And yeah, to compare that to having kids, like by existing, we take up resources that's a part of human existence. So if you're producing kids, you're not morally responsible for the resources that they consume, but you also are. Mm -hmm. Right. And it seemed like that box reporter got really caught up in the specifics and felt like it really has to add up to a hundred percent of responsibility. And yeah, it seemed like they, yeah, it kind of missed the point that it doesn't have to be 100%. Yeah, and I thought that that analogy that Travis used was a really great illustration. Yeah, right. I'm too bad that it opened up opened right. him up to be, <laughs> you know, for somebody to just be disingenuous and if they wanted to spin it that way. The headline makes it come off as, you know, very anti-kid. And yeah. The fact is right. the whole piece and the whole discussion is very pro, exactly. pro-kid. It's all about what we owe our children. Right. I'm just reading his conclusion right now, and he says, I don't think there is a tidy answer to the challenging questions of procreative ethics. As we face the very real prospect of catastrophic climate change, difficult, even uncomfortable conversations are important. Yes, we should discuss the ethics of making babies with care and respect, but we should discuss it. So his whole point is, yeah, just trying to start a conversation about this, not morally condemning people who have had kids. Which is the exact opposite of like the title. Right. (laughs) Yeah. And in fact, he's been so careful to try to avoid being misinterpreted that way. Right. Yeah. Well, you would think that if you're going to create an editorialized title, it would at least line up with like the content of the piece. I I don't know. Like that just seems ridiculous to me that it's just like that. It doesn't seem like this is the article that the title is about. I don't know. Yeah. This is probably the most blatant instance I've ever run across yeah. of such poor headline right. writing. I've seen mm-hmm. it. I've seen it, but never to this extent where it just that sucks. Yeah. Yeah. I want to kind of underscore that what Travis is saying, he's not saying that all kids are a problem. He's saying too many kids are a problem. And they're not necessarily a problem for us. They're a problem for the kids. You know, mm-hmm. if we conceive too many children, then we are responsible for creating a situation in which all of the children will suffer. They, yeah, they will suffer. They will not live on a planet that is hospitable. Well, and I think that's interesting because I think to some degree that argument should be like understandable to everyone unless you believe that there's an infinite amount of people we could have. Because even if you were a super pro growth person, at some point, I feel like you have to believe that there's some number of people that will be too much, even if you think it was like 17 billion or something. So theoretically, that argument is like, should not be like shocking to anyone. I don't know. Well, apparently that's not the case. <laughs> uh, right. What a great segue to our next topic. You know, speaking of fake headlines, in the Daily Beast on November 30th, we have, oh baby, the fertility rate is way down. And yes, that's a huge problem. Mm-hmm. Did you guys get a chance to look at that? Yeah. yeah, we did. And we actually talked about it on the way over here about whether it was even worth engaging with because I kind of compared it with like engaging with Breitbart at some points because it's just like so rambling and it doesn't really back up any of its arguments. And it's just like, yeah, yeah, it's, just, it's so all over the place. Like it starts out with Trump and then it brings up the standing army and like it's just like. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was satirical <laughs> a couple of times and then <laughs> and then realized it wasn't. But I just don't. Yeah, I wonder who the audience is for this columnist. And yeah, it's Matt Lewis. I don't know anything about him or what his qualifications are to be writing this. But I mean, yeah, he literally brings up that one of the reasons for maintaining our population size or growing our population size is because, quote, it helps to be able to field a standing army for conventional battle. (laughs) 
And <laughs> yeah, that's absurd. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's th- probably the most absurd, but also yeah. a larger population expands the pool of potential inventors and right, entrepreneurs. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and so I really wanted to, I hate to give him any attention or put the spotlight on him, but that's not an uncommon thing. I mean, you do hear that from growth boosters. If we have billions more people, we have that much more opportunity for, you know, some more geniuses, a few more Albert Einsteins right. in the mix. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when you're in the billions. And I think it's just that I think there's a lot of combination of, of the necessity for growth in our current, like, economic system. And so I think that's a lot of why you hear that so often. I sure. Don't know. Yeah. And that you can tell that was driving this piece. And Matt Lewis, I did a little bit of digging and he is a senior columnist at the Daily Beast. Wow. Uh, he was formerly with the Daily Caller. I mean, he's a known conservative mm-hmm. blogger, okay. commentator. He's conservative? Yes, he is. No kidding. Okay. And he wrote a book called Too Dumb to Fail, which is really yeah. pretty critical of what Trump has done to the GOP. So uh, he's not mm-hmm. a Trump fan, which, you right. know, it's one he's tiny clear from the little article yeah, too. <laughs> yeah. um, But he also edited a book of Sarah Palin quotes. <laughs> what? Fascinating. <laughs> Hardly a uh, feather in his cap. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he does acknowledge that uh, environmentalists have been telling us for some time that we cannot continue growing our population. Mm-hmm. Apparently, he doesn't see any limit. And he near the end says, the bottom line is that the doomsayers were wrong. Since World War II, our population has dramatically increased, yet we have actually become more efficient prosperous, and even more environmentally friendly. (laughs) This happy result, he says, was predicted by economists like Julian Simon and Esther Bosrup. Well, (laughs) you'll pardon me if I don't look to economists to advise me on the health of the Earth's ecosystems. Well, and the idea that we've become more environmentally friendly, like, Sure, the conversation about being environmentally friendly has definitely expanded, but that's been out of necessity, I think. Like, our (laughs) environmental problems have just become more and more dire and urgent. So, yeah, the conversation has grown, but I don't think... Maybe that is because the population has grown, but that (laughs) is not a good thing. Yeah, the boosters will tend to kind of look at a pretty narrow focus, and so they'll say the Cuyahoga River is not on fire anymore. That was a river outside of what Cleveland, I think it was, that was so polluted that it just caught on fire. Um, It's a little cleaner now. It's not on fire anymore. No, yeah. And the air quality in Los Angeles isn't as bad today, I guess, guess, as it was 25 years ago. However, it is getting worse again in in many ways. Uh, And people are dying from the the poor air quality in, in places like Los Angeles and, of course, we have carbon emissions and we're, you know, completely disrupting the climate of the planet and the species loss, you know, the, mm-hmm. the extinction, you know, he completely ignores. There's lots of mm-hmm. evidence as Water we know. Water usage. Yeah. 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 So he's just uh, got blinders on. What I think uh, we ought to do is let's talk about what the scientists tell us. Another great segue. That's two great Mm -hmm. segues in one podcast. What do you think, guys? (laughs) If only they were always that easy. Also, in November, -November, mid-November, the journal Bioscience published World Scientists' Warning to Humanity, a Second Notice. So it does seem that the world scientists don't share Matt Lewis's rosy assumptions about us having healthier planetary systems. Um, Shocker. (laughs) Yeah, really shocking. Now, the history of this is in 1992, the Union of Concerned Scientists plus 1,700 independent scientists around the world issued an alarm called World Scientists Warning to Humanity. They called on humankind to curtail environmental destruction. They cautioned that, and I quote, a great change in our stewardship of the earth and the life on it is required if vast human misery is to be avoided. That was in 1992. Now, in 2017, the scientists decided, well, I guess we'd better offer a checkup. Mm -hmm. 25 years ago, they were expressing concern about ozone depletion, freshwater availability, marine life depletion, ocean dead zones, forest loss, biodiversity, destruction, climate change, and continued human population growth. Well, how many of those things can we check off our list and say, yep, we took care of that? The ozone, (laughs) maybe. Yeah, one. (laughs) One. (laughs) One. Woo! (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Why is it that we couldn't have dealt with the others uh, like we did ozone? 
They're a little more challenging. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So here we are 25 years later, over 15,000 scientists, and they're not optimistic. And so let me read you guys a couple quotes from the second notice, and then I'd love to get your take on that. Since 1992, with the exception of stabilizing the stratospheric ozone layer, humanity has failed to make significant progress in generally solving these foreseen environmental challenges. And alarmingly, most of them are getting far worse. And you know what? I'm not quoting now, but making more babies is actually not on their uh, list of recommendations. Okay, okay. (laughs) They're not recommending making more babies. So I'll quote again. Scientists, media influencers, and lay citizens must insist that their governments take immediate action as a moral imperative to current and future generations of human and other life. It is also time to re-examine the change our individual behaviors, including limiting our own reproduction, ideally to replacement level at most, and drastically diminishing our per capita consumption of fossil fuels, meat, and other resources. Pretty good advice. Mm. Mm -hmm. So what do you want to highlight, underscore, or argue with? It just makes me think of like the access, like how many more people are going to read that Daily Beast article than like... This warning Mm. and just makes me sad. (laughs) I don't know. That's true. (laughs) Maybe we needed the NBC digital headline (laughs) writers (laughs) to write the headline. What would the title be for this? (laughs) Then no one. Then then people just would have picked through it to find comments that could yeah Yeah. tear it down. Yeah, but I think it would be a fun exercise, Ben. Let's come up. Let's see if we can't come up. Be like world scientists warning to humanity: you're all fucked. (laughs) 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 I would probably do it. I would click on that. That's not even that editorialized. No, it's not. <laughs> That's true. They would have used those words if they could. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, they just couldn't put that in a science journal, I think. Too bad. Ah, so where do we go with that? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how to get people to read stuff like this, but it was an interesting read. There were a few things in here that I wasn't expecting that stood out to me. Like one of their examples of diverse and effective steps humanity can take to transition to, to sustainability was revising our economy to reduce wealth inequality and ensure that prices, taxation, and incentive systems take into account the real costs which consumption patterns mm-hmm. impose on our environment. And I thought that was really cool because I've thought about that a lot with like how meat or corn is subsidized in the U.S. Like I've thought about that a lot with our food system, but not with wealth inequality in general. But it makes sense that, yeah, we talk about how procreation, like there should be more and more incentives the wealthier you are to not procreate as much because you're likely to consume more and more resources. So I think it's interesting that balancing wealth inequality is one of their recommendations. I thought that was really cool. Yeah, I wouldn't have necessarily expected that. Right. No, I mean, certainly either. from the social justice arm of the good-hearted people out there, you would get that. But from just from the cold, hard scientists, so that's a little bit of a surprise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it makes sense to me. I don't know. And it, it makes me think about the Daily Beast article, too, because, yeah, one of the things that Matt Lewis wrote is that maybe the kid who would have cured cancer was never even born. And there are so many ways to fault that argument. But I was just thinking like, yeah, or maybe they don't have access to education or a platform for their ideas. And yeah, just thinking about all of the good things, even yeah, environmentally that that could come from more equally distributed wealth. Mm -hmm. Good for you. Good for you. So... Other than we are fucked, <laughs> you would expect if this is a, uh, you know, c- comes from over 15,000 scientists and it's in a scientific journal, you would expect it's going to be 77 pages or 177 pages and a long appendix and everything. But it's really not a not a tough read. Right. It's a pretty short read. Uh, so I would recommend that you check it out. And we'll include a link to the World Scientist Warning Second Notice in the show notes as well. Worth reading, and I wish we could find a way without having to write some sensationalist headlines to get that out there. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to touch on the one thing that uh, one of the many from the Daily Beast article talking about, like that, like we should have more kids because maybe like the kid who is going to cure cancer wasn't born because people like encourage people to have less kids, and that just I don't know that argument just always drives me crazy. I don't know. I think that's a very silly argument. 
Yeah. I don't know. So I guess I could maybe underscore what we're about, what we think, you know, we should be doing in response to the scientist's warning. And that is, Mm -hmm. because we've talked quite a bit about uh, family size decisions today, but that's Mm -hmm. a part of it, a a huge part of it, because we are so far into overshoot. We can't just pick one solution. We need to be working on a number of things. So we do need to be getting human population numbers coasting back as quickly as possible in a humane and voluntary way to a more sustainable numbers. We're at 7.6 billion today. And the scientists who've done the most serious estimates on this think that we need to be below 3 billion. Mm. Uh, and that's not impossible. And we could be there in a century or less if we just got serious about our family size decisions and we didn't have the kind of crap that uh, Travis Reeder had to put up with. That's part of it. But the other thing is our per capita consumption and just how large we are living, uh, at least the the richest one or two billion people on the planet. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know there are five billion people on the planet who are living pretty simply and a billion people who really are malnourished. And uh, they deserve to have space to actually improve their lives a little bit. But those of us that are the richest billion, and I call it the overdeveloped world, those of mm-hmm. us who just got carried away with the last 200 years, we got, got on this binge of prosperity, we need to scale back. We cannot keep living the way we live in the United States, in Australia, in Canada, in uh, some of the wealthier parts of, of the Middle East, uh, and even Europe. Europeans are doing a lot better than we are, but they still are living even a little bit too large on the planet. We need to scale back. We've we got to fly less, drive less, live in smaller houses, eat, eat less meat or no meat, stop flushing the toilet, right? <laughs> All the little things, too. We talked in our last episode about the things that you can do as an individual to uh, make a difference. And there and there are little things like not using the disposable plastic grocery bags at the grocery store, mm-hmm. take, taking a bag. And uh, that's one thing I kind of take exception to what Travis has written is he, he tends to sort of dismiss that in a way. He says that those little actions don't yeah, they don't make a lot of really? difference, but there's still a moral obligation to behave to behave well. And I would disagree. I think they make a difference. You take a, a small action and you multiply that by a million people doing it, and it becomes significant. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, I think it's a, it's a, it's a matter of scale. Like maybe it's like not the same as like no one flying anymore, but that doesn't mean it's not significant at all if no one uses plastic bags anymore. I don't know. Well, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I like, even though he said it might not be practically significant, he talked about it being morally significant. And I like that idea that, because yeah, it would be, would be weird to live in a world where our actions had to be, I don't remember his exact word choice, but he talks about if we only did things that were proven scientifically to be effective at changing whatever problem we want to affect, like, if that was how we lived, that would just be a very different world. And I think, yeah, good we point. all have some moral intuition. Yeah, good point, good point. But I, I just want to, I kind of beat on that a little bit. It's a pet peeve of mine because I, don't, I just don't think we all should be sitting around waiting for the system <laughs> to change. Yeah, mm-hmm. Even the system change starts with us. And I think if right, we, right. we make all those little things and we, and we start to make multiple decisions day in, day out, it becomes top of mind. And then all of a sudden, it's a lot easier to recognize when public policy is loony. Right. You know, right. today we don't question the fact that, you know, that we're celebrating in here in the U.S. that we hit 3.3% economic growth in the last quarter, annualized rate. We're celebrating that. Right. Got to change our culture. And I think it's more likely to happen if everybody in every action, every day in their daily living is more oriented toward good planetary stewardship. Yeah. Well, and I think an an underrated part of that is that when your actions change, you end up starting a lot of conversations too. And those can lead to different policies eventually through enough people and enough action. Yeah. Yep. Well, so shall we move right into lightning to load then? Kind of another good segue. Every podcast episode so far in the Growth Busters series, we do have this section where we each share something sometimes entertaining, sometimes quirky, sometimes just really good advice, something we're doing in our lives to, to lighten our load. Who wants to go first today? I can go. Great. This one, yeah, came to me earlier today. I know that a lot of people like to leave a front porch light on. 
that night to prevent break-ins or whatever the reason. And installing motion-activated mm. lights is a better way to prevent break-ins and also to save energy. Pretty simple. Well, mine is, I guess I've like mostly done water ones and, and I have another, I don't, I don't think I've done this one before, but when I shower, I, when the water is warming up, I put a, a bucket under the faucet and then I gather that water. And then once it's warm, I turn the shower on and, and just take my shower. But then when I have to flush the toilet, the, you can actually take the bucket and dump it in the bowl and if you do it in the right way it will actually flush your toilet for you and that saves a lot of water you've got to have the technique down yeah there's just a little bit of technique but what do you think i think he might have told us that one before. yeah did i really told us it. that one before oh, <laughs> we're gonna have to start keeping a like a list i know so right we... right well because what is this episode number six or seven no i seven. think we're on seven wow. now yeah it's so we're gonna run tip, out though. yeah <laughs> It is a good one too. And I started making a list, but I didn't take time to go back and check. So I might even be uh, circling back. So mine is something that I still fail at frequently. It's not as automatic as I want it to be, but that is when I go to eat at a restaurant to think ahead and take a container with me to, mm. for, to bring home oh, leftovers. That's smart. Uh, that makes sense. A reusable uh, container so that I don't end up with styrofoam in too many cases. But even if you go someplace where they give you a compostable container, you yeah. know, it's still. Right something new and you know something it, that had to be had produced to be, yeah, it had to be manufactured and and so i try really hard to remember to take a container that i can just bring home and eat out of and then wash and reuse again and again and again I'm trying to get better at that yeah i love also just that you mentioned taking home the food that you don't eat because food waste is another really big pet peeve of mine even if you only have a couple bites left it'll make a great snack like yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because most restaurants here in the overdeveloped United States of America, they give you too much food. Mm -hmm. You know, I wish that they would really cut back on the portions. I really love the restaurants where you've got the choice on the menu on a lot of items. You can choose uh, a lighter portion, save mm -hmm. a little bit of money. But even if they didn't charge less, I would be thrilled if you were ordering a hamburger. And I know you wouldn't, <laughs> Caitlin, but, you know, if you're not stuck with a half pound <laughs> hamburger right. you know right um, i do love leftovers though yeah so it's rare that i finish a very rare that i finish a restaurant yeah. meal so in those cases where it's just not going to be convenient for you to take home leftovers or impossible another way to solve that problem is to split the meal with whoever you're dining with mm. yeah and my wife and i do that frequently that's smart or if you have like a leftover half sandwich that's untouched you can also give it to someone yeah. on the street. That's always a good option too. Very true. Very true. All right. Any, you know, earth shaking final <laughs> sentences? I don't think so. I think we're... We've got to send people out there into the world more optimistic than Travis left us. <laughs> well, Travis makes me optimistic, even when he's feeling <laughs> pessimistic. He makes me optimistic because... He's a great example that there are people doing really important work on behalf of the environment. Well, so Travis, if you're listening, we want you to know that we here at Growth Busters really appreciate what you're doing. And there are a lot of other people who do too and are paying attention and no more fake headlines from NBC News. Yeah, we, we need better headlines. And uh, God, that was just such a disservice to the conversation. Mm -hmm. Heartbroken about that. Well, that completes another episode of the Growth Busters podcast. Don't forget to explore issues at growthbusters.org. Check out our analysis of pro-growth bias in the media at growthbiasbusted.org. And I want a little aside on that. You know, that's a weekly blog post where I'm usually I'm offering some kind of criticism of some pro-growth mania in the media, the things that are fed to us that keep us worshiping growth. And now for a good long stretch, probably about three months, I have been putting more items on the wall of fame than on the wall of shame. And a wall, mm. the wall of fame gets action when I see some good example in the media where these issues are getting more accurate coverage. Huh. So I think the last two months I had nothing on the wall of shame, just wow. on the wall of fame. That's exciting. Yeah. Last week, somebody finally made the wall of shame, and we'll, hmm. we may talk about that in the future episode. But anyway, that's at growthbiasbusted.org. And it just helps you to kind of tune up your radar so that you begin to recognize when you're being fed propaganda that is really against your best interests, that makes you think that 3.3% economic growth is something to celebrate, for example. Right. Yep. All right. Well, 
Thanks for listening. Practice safe sex. (laughs) (laughs) And we'll see you next time. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Some may dream to paint mountains and streams, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Some may just want more, but don't know what it's for, but not me. I'm a growth buster. Don't want a solution at the cost of pollution. They think bigger is better at the cost of the weather. But no, not us. We are the growth busters. Calling, 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 calling.